everyone. Ho oh, ho. Welcome to the Stoa. Today we have Liv Burry uh, joining us. Uh, Liv is a former professional poker player who got interested in game theory and all things Moloch, the god of unhealthy competition. And most people at the Stoa, I imagine, are aware of Scott Alexander's famous essay, uh, Meditations of Moloch, which was an inspiration for, for Liv uh, to explore this topic on her YouTube channel. And the last time we we discussed Moloch at the Stoa, I think it was Daniel Schmachtenberger, a session called Converting Moloch uh, from Sith to Jedi, like over two years now. This is during the, the COVID lockdown. And it looks like Schmachtenberger just like crawled out of bed. <laughs> he was like dropping some wisdom bombs on uh, on how to get in the right relationship with Moloch. It was a pretty epic session. And that session inspired an amazing phenomenon that happened at the Stoa. Uh, our good friend uh, Anjan, who will be interviewing the lift today, uh, started asking every single Stoa guest uh, about Moloch as if they knew what the heck Moloch was. Uh, it was actually, I was starting to get worried, but uh, I have to get like a highlight reel of Anjan asking all those, all those questions to those uh, guests. And Anjan is a, a CEO of a, a company called Jangle, and he's in the process of doing something quite incredible with it. Uh, and he has a uh, sensitivity to Moloch, um, hence uh, I, why I asked him to interview uh, Liv today. Uh, so Liv and Anjan are going to have a 30-minute conversation about Moloch, and then Anjan's going to take me in, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So if you have questions for Liv anytime, pop them in the chat. Uh, when the Q&A starts, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask Liv your question. If you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that, and I will... Uh, read your question on your behalf. So uh, that being said, Liv, welcome to Stella and Anjan, I'm gonna take you in. Thanks having me. Good to meet you all. Uh, okay, so I, I'm so tempted to just ask you all these super intellectual high fluting questions, but it would be so <laughs> simple. Uh, start, let's start off easy. Yeah, if I, if I was seven years old, how, how would you explain what Moloch is to me? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would explain it as that thing where that feeling you get when you want to, you have the option of doing the, you know, you could, your friends and you have all been given a hundred sweets to divide up and no one will see in the, at least for the short, you know, right now, how many sweets, let's say you've got 10 friends and a hundred sweets, no one will see. Um, how many you give out versus how many you keep, well, how many you keep to yourself, all they'll know is how many they receive. Um, and so if you go and give, yeah, and so you might be tempted to keep like 50 of those sweets to yourself and just give, you know, um, five or whatever the number comes to, to everyone else. Um, you know, that, and, and that, that might work out for you in the short term, but if you, if everyone kept doing that, then obviously no one would end up with any sweets. It would be a very bad outcome. Um, I think that would be kind of the metaphor I would go down anyway, some way of like basically explaining how Moloch is this short term is when people do the short term selfish action um, that gives them a, you know, a leg up on everybody else. Um, but that if everyone ends up doing that, then everyone will ends up wor worse off. Um, you know, so I think it would have to be, I would have to think about it, but some kind of analogy like that would be the way to do it. Yeah. I mean, in the style of continuing to ask questions like a seven-year-old, like, why is it even helpful to have the word Moloch or even call it that rather than just being like, people are being mean. Oh, hello? People don't care about people in the future. They don't care. Like, wh why even have this word? Like, have, what, what's, what's the usefulness of it? Uh, Andrew, you're cutting out. Is this happening for others? Yeah. Do you want me to say that again? Um, Hello. <laughs> uh, Liv, I can see I can see the rest of the people without legs. So I think there's something off with maybe your connection. Looks like you might have to entertain us about uh, Moloch. <laughs> 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 Moloch was so you know. <laughs> Let's do your seven-year-old seven -year -old definition. Um, oh my God. Is it okay to like 
play a, a GIF or something like that. So he made a GIF of Noam Chomsky's manufactured consent, and it's so good. And he basically has two people, um, two people being news organizations. And so one of them is like, hey, guys, today, like nothing really happened. And everybody's like, oh, cool, nice day, da 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 da. That's the audience. And then the next day, the news guy is like, um, yeah, so nothing really happened today. And everybody's like, oh, that's kind of boring, yeah. And then a new guy comes in and he's just like, if you drink too much water, you will get cancer. And everybody rushes over to him. Um, and the first guy is like, what? And he then is like, Pamela Anderson has fake boobs and everybody rushes over to him. And it's this like race to the bottom that ensues because somebody looking for that edge across other people then does that. And so um, I feel like the classical definitions of like, oh, he's the God of coordination failure. Like he's what happens when we all don't play nice together. Like I still like keep asking myself the question, like why the word Moloch? Like us as intellectuals, we're obsessed with this. But why can't we just say like, it's when we pick what's best for us, not what's best for others. Like what extra thing are we getting there? And so um, any of the examples that come to me, I feel like capture 80% of it or 70% of it. And so my question for Liv's gonna be like, what's that last 20% that's missing? Here's another example of the way I conceive Moloch. I think it's imprecise, it only captures 70% of it, but it's like the uncle who all the kids love because he like hands out candy at the party versus the uncle, like all the kids are like, oh, you brought hummus and celery sticks again. Like he's kind of better for everybody and all the parents know he's good, but like that uncle is always losing out to the uncle that is pandering, picking that short-term choice, being cynical. Um, and so there is something, this is probably taken from Schmachtenberger, but there's something, there's something about like, kind of Moloch being that kind of defect cooperate cascade where it's like if you knew everybody had everybody's back and if you could just do the right thing and you knew things would work out for you maybe then you'd feel safe to do it but if even if you like suspect that somebody else is going to fuck you well you rather fuck them first and so you're going to be the first to to do that cynical choice or pander or do what's best for you or take advantage of the comments or something so hey guys can you hear me Yep. Hi. So sorry. I I really don't know what just happened. I just restarted my router, but like my internet's normally perfect, so this is strange. Um, apologies. Hi, easy go. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I just ranted at people for like three minutes there, so I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me just look at the chat for a second and see if anybody had. Ooh, greediness cascade. Um, but sorry, yeah, you were in the middle of kind of like, why do we even have this word Moloch? Like, it's cool. Like, I guess if, you know, we're like Timothy Morton, hyper objects, like, oh, we gave it a name. Oh, we can talk about it. But like, other than us intellectuals now able to have a word to then now focus on an issue, like, why, why is it even helpful to just be like Moloch versus, hey, people are being greedy. Hey, people are being mean. Hey, people are being inconsiderate. Like, what? What's these? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's because it's a little bit more complex than just being greedy, right? It's it's this combination of like basically a system doesn't turn molecky unless it's a badly designed um, in a way whereby, you know, it just takes a few bad actors to kind of ruin it for everybody. Um, but also you need a certain threat, a minimum threshold of bad actors in the first, or, or at least people who are um, of sufficient self-interest to not have the wisdom to like zoom out and go, wait a second, if everybody does this, then everything sort of collapses. So I shouldn't do this, you know, even if I think others aren't. You, you need those two ingredients, but because of the nature of most of these problems, they're so multi-agent, you know, we're talking like hundreds, thousands, millions of people sometimes. Um, it's basically inevitability that you're going to have um, that minute reach that minimum threshold. So it's it, it because it's that sort of it's got these sort of two pronged things. It's 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 too complex to simply just describe as it's people being greedy, even though that is a very major part of it. 
Could you kind of give me like your personal aha there? Like where you probably understood that people did stuff that was suboptimal for each other, but what was like the mental upgrade when you got the concept of Moloch? You're like, oh shit. Like now I understand this, or this gets more parsimonious or simple. Like, I'm curious what that looks right. like. Right. Um, it was when I was reading meditation, it was reading Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander. It just, it was the closest thing to like a religious experience of reading a piece of piece of writing. I guess that, and when I read like Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now for the first time when I was like, you know, 22 or whatever. Um, it was it was a similar level, even more of, of just like a deep light bulb moment where it was like, I'd had this like, kind of, I've been, you know, interested in existential risk and, or at least catastro global catastrophic risk for a long time, but I'd never quite had the language or like, I hadn't been able to internally grok why certain risks seem much more terrifying to me than others. Because like most people, like, you know, when they think of existential risk, you know, the average person is like, oh yeah, like the super volcano under Yellowstone or an asteroid hitting us. And, you know, those are scary concepts, but they never, I, I couldn't put my finger on why they never really, I mean, aside of the fact that they're actually, you know, just statistically that quite improbable over the next century, at least, um, compared to uh, the other ones. It, 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 but it was, it was like, what is it about these other issues that like, keep weighing on my mind, like AI, like synthetic biology, you know, like, um, uh, synthetic pathogens um, as technology gets more democratized. What is it about these, like, this flavor of existential risk that is like so terrifying? Why, why did these weigh on my mind more? And it's because they're actually harder to fix because they are arising from molecky dyna dynamics. Um, you know, whereas an asteroid is just, and it's just an asteroid and it's like, maybe we'll be able to avert it, maybe we won't, but at least like there's a single, it's, it's a fairly, e there's a, literally a target you can hit, so to speak. Um, or at least a way of like making um, making society more robust against it. Whereas you know, with these with these uh, multipolar traps, which are like relying on coordination to fix, uh, they, they just seem they seem so difficult, like insurmountably difficult to do. And so, um, yeah, it was it was and 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 that piece by Scott Alexander just. I mean, it's just, I know everyone here has probably read it, but if you haven't, honestly, like it's something I think people should go and read like once a year at minimum, because it, it's super long, you'll forget it. And it's, every time you read it, there's like a new thing that jumps out that you've forgotten. It's, it's just an absolute masterpiece. Um, and so that was really what the light bulb moment was. I read it and I just had goosebumps down my body over and over as I kept reading it. I was like, this is, this is what we need to fix. Um, and, you know, maybe I've always just had an obsession with like delving into the most abstract concepts possible. And this is a very abstract concept, but um, yeah, that was, that was the light bulb moment. And I was like, okay, he's managed to persuade, you know, he's, he's popularized this and put it into the language people need through the written word. My relative sort of talent is probably um, making weird, funny videos about sort of esoteric concepts. So uh, maybe that will be my angle of approach. Let me see if I can make a YouTube series out of this. So that's been like my, my sort of mission over the last year and a half. Yeah, let, let me let me try to paraphrase to see if I, I'm catching the crux of what you're saying. Um, it's kind of like there's people who are like, oh, climate change, and the, this is the biggest thing. I'm going to focus it. Identity, what's the solution? Mm -hmm. to that? Other people for AI safety, and that's what they go into, and other people for bioterrorism. And there's like this kind of like, this is the biggest problem, and this is what I'm going to focus on. This is what's required for this. But it's almost like in Harry Potter, like there's all these horcruxes, and the horcruxes are actually just an element of the big boss behind it, like Voldemort all the way behind. Yes. And it's kind of like you stop seeing the surface of each of these problems. You're like, holy shit, there's the big boss that's actually behind each of these things. That's Moloch. That's coordination failure or that more expanded definition we're talking about here. Is that a fair like capture of what that light bulb moment is? Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. I really like that metaphor of like kind of the whole cruxes. And it's, it's, yeah, it's like the end boss. I mean, some people say entropy is the end boss, and but it, I, I don't, I don't think so. Entropy is a kind of neutral process. Moloch is the thing that takes advantage of entropy in order to make the world, you know, in, in order to sort of optimize for like an overly narrow goal. You know, the the ultimate instantiation of Moloch is like the paperclip maximizer, right? Um, it's it's over optimizing for a single goal, sacrificing everything else in order to achieve something. Um, so. Uh, you know, in order to achieve a, a, a singular outcome, um, and, you know, and everything else then just gets laid to waste as a result. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, I think probably the best descriptor of it I've heard is Daniel Schmachtenberger calling it a general uh, generator function. Um, I don't know if that's his original term, but that's who I heard it from. And it, it's because it is it's 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 almost like a, a, a it, yeah, it's like a mathematical function, really, right? That it just um, it doesn't actually exist in physical space. It's it's as a result of like relations between agents that gives rise to this thing under the right set of circumstances. And unfortunately, it seems like it's like, without a lot of conscious effort, most systems end up devolving into that. Okay, okay so two, two things are coming up for me when you say that. Um, one is like, is it unfair to be reductive and just say like what it really is, is putting self-interest in front of group interest. And then the, the question that comes out of me there is like, isn't that like humanity's defining trait, like in some sense, us in having such diversity as hunter gatherers or whatever is figuring out through guilt, through shame, through morality, through whatever norms that we have within the Dunbar number, figuring out ways to have group interest get over self-interest because as a biological entity, you know, self-interest is that primary algorithm of survival. And then we are like, holy shit, cooperation actually is what allows us to scale. Is it fair to say like, Moloch is not actually anything new or unique. It's just like this stuff that we figured out that made humanity so powerful, which is to cooperate below the Dunbar number, doesn't work above the Dunbar number. And Moloch is, holy shit, what do we do above the Dunbar number for all of this? Is that is that too reductive? Like, or is there? Um, I've actually not heard it really framed that way. Um... I don't think it's no. I mean, it's probably I mean, a little do you buy the frame. I, I, yeah. No, I know I do buy the frame. I mean, definitely. It, it depends on what your exact definition of it is. I, I took a bit of artistic license in calling it, you know, the god of negative sum games. Um, it, it's some people like that framing, some don't. Um, it's in terms of, you know, were 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 there were there you know, back in hunter-gatherer times when everyone was under the Dunbar number, were there these like lose-lose situations routinely happening? Um, it's difficult, you know, it depends on where you draw the boundary around the like competitive interaction. Like I'm sure there were some in little, little pockets, you know, or certainly when like tribes would go to war against each other because they were above the Dunbar number then, and then like those tribes ended up getting decimated, you know, it ended up being a kind of lose-lose thing over the short term, but long run, you know, that those competitive interactions have gotten society to where it is today, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like the Dunbar number is like a very crucial point in terms of where we can easily coordinate, but at the same time, arguably the agricultural revolution created a, an ability for humanity to coordinate in ways that it had never done before. Um, you know, like mimetic influence was much more, became much more powerful. Uh, rules and regulations within these like proto cities or towns um, certainly enabled people to coordinate very, very well. But again, like, you know, depending on who you speak to, some people are saying that the agricultural revolution was the worst thing to ever happen to humans in terms of like suffering on a mass scale. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, 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 I think, I think it's a little over reductive just because it, there are you can you can pick examples of where we've been able to actually coordinate better and cooperate better with larger numbers thanks to our like technological advances or our, at least our societal technology advances um but it's definitely you know I, I think if we could you know if humanity suddenly went back to being 50 people then sure we would be coordinating pretty well so Moloch would be less of a, much less of an issue no, it's, I mean, I think it's more Moloch arises when there's when obviously there's like so much scarcity um, that there is no space for people to uh, to you know like this sort of you require more and more um, advanced ways of cooperating in in order to sort of stay afloat. Uh, veto me if you think this is like me just pushing a frame that I find useful, but it's not that great. It's like, I have a friend, he's the nicest guy in the world. There's like no chance he could hurt a fly. But for fun, cause he was a good programmer. He just like spent a summer draining like random Ethereum wallets he was able to find. And I'm like, dude, you're stealing money. He's like, uh. and he was just very sheepish, but like, he's just like the nicest guy. And in real life, like 
he just can't do anything. But there's something about just the loss of humanity when it's just like a number on a screen. Right. Able to do that. And so there's something, it, it, is it about like, what's happening in person? Why can't he like steal from somebody in person? He feels some amount of emotion and guilt, the person's facial emotions. There's a reality to it that's just being compressed and thrown away when we go into scale mm. and distance and therefore have these mediums in between us. Am I right to say like Moloch is also a function of that? Because Scott Alexander's essays with the rats makes me like wonder about this, but I'm just like wondering if, if Moloch is, I'm going to throw something into your backyard rather than mine. I'm going to throw something into the future mm. rather than deal with it today. I'm going to like push it to somebody else rather than me. Didn't humanity kind of solve that stuff? with the emotions we feel and is the problem that scale and distance that just removes all those solutions like yeah so i mean definitely one of like moloch's toolkits is um digitization and like specifically sort of compressing the complexity of the human experience down into these little met metrics you know whether it's number of followers number of likes um the the plus minus of a you know of a trade uh, yeah, you know, the 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 over quanti quantification of different metrics um, is very useful for Moloch because it 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 reduces, pe as you said, like reduces people down. Um, and yeah, the identifiable victim phenomenon is a very real thing. Uh, you know, like it's there's a reason why charities make their commercials with a story of like this is this is little Jimmy and this is uh, he lost his leg because of this and so on and it's got you know if we see a face it triggers all of our empathy buttons um, because, you know, that's how we evolved. We evolved out of like, again, like seeing people nearby to us suffering and us caring for them, especially if they looked anything like us, but, you know, just seeing a face uh, makes a huge difference. Um, and unfortunately that doesn't always, uh, you know, charities take advantage of that. And, and perhaps the less, the less sexy charities therefore lose out on this because they don't have an easily identifiable victim, even though like actually, the, the issues they are working on are, are enormous and actually much more important. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all that your friend is able to just sort of play this game in this kind of like emotional vacuum where it's, it's chances are like, you know, he's, it's, it's contributing to more suffering in the world. Um, you know, to an extent, I felt this myself in poker when I was playing professionally, I would, Sometimes, you know, I, I, there were times when I, I, you know, let's say I've been pounding on a particular player at the table and I can see them really starting to get agitated and I can see they're like clearly getting in this comfort zone where they're losing more money than they want to. And I'm like, I sometimes ask myself, I'm like, well, I know this is the game, but I clearly am causing this person distress. I don't want them to be going home, like not, you know, not being able to tell their wife how much they lost and that kind of thing. And that would like quite often be a problem that I think a lot of poker players wrestle with. Um, Whereas you playing online, I don't know who that person is. It's just, you know, it's a faceless number on the screen and I'm just rubbing my hands together every time I win a big pot. Um, so, you know, it's it's just part of the human experience that it, if we, the, the more remote we become, um, the more abstract the concept of winning and losing in terms of its actual real world impacts become, then the easier it is for Moloch to do its thing. Um. Okay, <laughs> three things are coming up there. Uh, woo stuff, asteroids, and trauma. <laughs> okay. Uh, the woo stuff is like, uh, Schmachtenberger talks about like how there's kind of three main problems here. The coordination failure Moloch problem. The other one is principal agent. And the third is like rules for rulers. Mm. Uh, and his point is like the underlying solution to all of this is like okay if the point here is you're doing something that's like good for you and you're like tossing away the other whether you're considering it or not considering it the solution to all of this is just realizing the other is you mm -hmm. and so if everything is you the most selfish thing to do is to care about all of that you're not going to chop your foot off um, right fun and so do you think in some sense there's an underlying spiritual religious kind of bigger frame component to solving Moloch, yes. which is in that Buddhist kind of like, oh, that is me as well. Like I'm, I'm wondering your personal journey there and the kind of bigger picture involved. 
Yeah, I, I'm increasingly leaning. Before I was like, oh, we just need to devise smarter systems and that will be sufficient. But in some ways, I think that's, I mean, we should definitely be having people thinking about that extensively. Um, and especially, you know, good good systems designers, This, I hope this would be uh, what they're really focusing all their efforts on moving forward. Um, but we also need some kind of, again, do we need 100% of humanity to sort of... Uh, become good stoans and good uh you know good stoics and good uh you know fully enlightened no probably not but we certainly need to sort of upgrade a hefty percentage of the population to at least be aware of this stuff and to sort of expand their moral circle so that they see that when you know they think they're just like polluting the commons they're really polluting themselves their own backyard um you know uh, so I think actually I'm, I'm increasingly becoming more on the spiritual side of stuff. Um, and I'm not saying that just because I just got back from Burning Man, uh, although that probably is contributing, but it, it's just uh, like, what I'm like, thinking about at the moment is like how to, um, how to popularize this concept so that we can get as many like, you know, people on YouTube aware of the fact that they need to like be less competitive in the, in in their everyday interactions to start seeing, um, you know, like to understand finite versus infinite games, how to reduce, you know, uh, as you just as you correctly described, like get getting people to see others as themselves. Um, and I don't know how to do that, but it's just like oh, like there's you know there's there's lots of it this is there's clearly like a taste for that within the online community right now like um you know within the game b community there, there's there's these little pockets of of people realizing that right now there, there, people starting to realize that like there's this huge competition for memory going on in the like in the in meme space and if we aren't making a conscious effort to insert good memes then the bad ones will win um and um you know the question is is like how centralized do we want to make this like should everyone who's thinking about this be all working together on a singular you know religion so to speak um or like a spiritual upgrade or should like many of us be doing lots of different ones and like sort of cross cross pollinating each other I, I don't know um but that's just sort of what's currently on my mind right now I think again my my comparative advantage would be working on this aspect of like trying to raise the sanity waterline of as many people as possible um you know so taking that approach as opposed to working on this specific re systems redesign it's interesting that like kevin's in this call because i recently listened to um a video he did with schmachtenberger and um i guess the frame that's coming up for me is this kind of like spirituality woo woo or even like trauma stuff is almost like a bottom-up approach to get yes. attacked. Yeah. And especially for me, like where I would like coordinate less than I wanted to is this like feeling of scarcity where I'm like, nobody's going to be for me. If I'm just going to help other people and then like I'm left alone, that makes me feel like shit. So I'm just going to like take care of myself first. And it was only like with my self-work, like being present with that fear and realizing mm. where that comes from, then I actually could be a little bit more expansive with others. So that kind of gave me some flavor there. But to the point of mentioning Kevin, there's almost like, maybe it's the wrong word, but like a top down kind of collective intelligence, technologies, different ways to actually align people's incentives and stuff. I know there's a lot of people who are in that bottom up camp. I know there's lots of people where the top down camp feels more scalable or legible or act like you can act on it. How do you kind of relate to these different yeah, well, I actually wanted to ask you, can you give me an example of one of these, like, what you, of a top-down approach that you think is most promising? Kevin, can I tag you in? Um, yeah, hey, sure. What's up? Hey. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that basically this is like the blind man and the elephant, right? So we can talk about top-down versus bottoms-up, but recognizing that nothing is totally complete. Um I'm not sure exactly what you meant by top down, but are you talking about like using logos instead of ethos, like a logical system? Uh, it's almost like bottom up is like each individual doing their own trauma work, each of them coming to this kind of bigger, as Nick's saying in the chat, this like unitive state that we're all one. 
yeah. versus top down being like some sort of technology and protocols sure. and big thing that then works across a lot of people that uh, yeah so like change of self versus change of system kind of mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh we don't need to go down this this rabbit hole, but uh, I guess like I'll out myself as a crypto guy. And one of the things that we think uh, is really cool about Ethereum is you have this programmable, global, transparent ledger that anyone can build collective intelligence systems on. So what if we could better express our preferences about what we want in the commons and then coordinate resources using smart contracts and it's all done efficiently in, in web scale. And so uh, using coordination tech to solve coordination failure is like a change of system thing that, that I'm deeply involved in. But yeah, you, you outed me as the crypto guy in the group, so. <laughs> uh, that sounds awesome. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we need, we just need both approaches. Um, and I, I imagine given mm -hmm. the, like the, the difficulty of this problem, I would be surprised if, if one approach would be sufficient. I think it needs to be both. Um, and in terms of like, also, I, I wonder whether you would include in this top down category, you know, the idea of like a sort of centralized meme uh, or like, you know, a meme that spreads like so a, a character I've been thinking of developing, um, which is kind of like the inverse of Moloch, you know, if Moloch is the god of negative sum games, what was the god of positive sum games? Um, <laughs> in meditations on Moloch, like uh, the, the post, um, Scott ref refers to a god called Elua, E-L-U-A, um, which kind of touches on that. But the uh, the one I've been thinking of calling just because I can think of a better name is Win-Win. Uh, and it's like Win-Win, you know, it's 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 infinitely wise, but it also, opt it's not like one of these more ethereal kind of boring gods. It, it's like mischievous and fun and it values games for games' sake. So it likes competition um, and it knows how to, you know, it's, it's not like, oh no, we just must all purely collaborate all the time. It likes having competition too, um, but it just is wise enough to know how to constrain that competition so that, that you can control the externalities. So uh, I'm thinking about like how to, you know, what would this God look like? Um, how would it, you know, confront Moloch without, you know, if, if it's the God of win-win, then technically if it tries to defeat Moloch, then it would also, um, uh, it would therefore no longer be win-win. It'd be a, like a win, you know, be a zero something. So how does it cope with that? But so th there's a lot of like technicality to work out. But I'm trying to sort of like paint an aesthetic of it and hope that like something, um, something sticks. Um, and so that I'm, I'm wondering whether you would consider that, like if like if I was successful in getting this meme of win-win out there, would that be considered a top-down thing or would that be a bottom-up in your framework? <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like na nature is that. It's just that combination. Like, is a body bottom up or top down? I don't know. I'm not telling right. my genius right now to produce insulin, but at the same time, I can move my right. heart. So. I mean, again, the highest, the higher complexity state would be both, right? So it's probably that. Yeah. So um, we're going to switch to QA here in a second, but if I could sneak in um, another question. Uh, how do I say this concisely? I'm curious how your conception and excitement of like solutions has like changed over time. And to your point around win-win, so maybe this is like two questions. Where have you most found that like God of positive sum? Is there a game? Is there a country? Is there a book? Is there a scenario? Is there a company? Is there a place where you're like, oh, that, more of that. You know, Burning Man or like native potluck ceremonies or maybe some examples that at least seem proximate to some of that. So I'm just kind of curious about mm. you know, over time. Yeah, I mean, not to you know pull on the cliche, but I mean, Burning Man is <sighs> Burning Man's the best example of you know the reason why I go there every year. It's not just for the fun; it's because it it reminds me of it refreshes my faith in humanity, um, and that's why I think it's so important that you know not only as many people go as possible, but like that existing people who've gone try and spread spread the like concepts as widely as possible because it really is the closest thing to like a protopia I've ever seen. Um, so, you know, that's an example where, to be fair, like within Burning Man, competition is minimized. There's, there's, there's very, very little, because it's not about, you know, it tries to eradicate any commodification. There's no advertising, there's no money. It's all like, a, it's a radical abundance economy. People think it's about bartering, but it's not, it's about gifting, uh, giving without expecting anything in return. Um, 
you know, so competition is uh, extremely minimized. That said, there's still competition, you know, not only that, like, there's a lot of people playing games, like I randomly walk down the street and there's like a huge chess match going on or a dick measuring contest or whatever the hell, you know, contest people are thinking of. Um, you know, there's, there's still these like little pockets of competition, but it's done in a win-win way. And that it's like, you know, it's strictly done for the sake of fun, not, not for the sake of like getting ahead. Um, so that's that, you know, if like, if, if win-win was to design a city, it would look like Burning Man, that's for sure. Um, oh. Do you have any non-Burning Man examples? Yeah. Um, well, poker, so poker can be either. Um, I think actually funny enough, poker is increasingly becoming mollicky just because uh, there's not as much abundant, um, there's basically, there's a theoretical ceiling of like game theory optimal play that the average person is getting closer and closer to. So there's less um, abundance in the game. Uh, so, but once upon a time, I would have said poker was actually a very win-win thing by and large, because even though it's technically the most you know, classic definition of a zero sum game, you know, everyone's sits down someone walks away with the money and that someone else loses the externalities usually were, were pretty positive especially amongst at least you know amongst the, the good players because you just learn so much about decision making and so on um so that, um, that's pretty i mean that's probably not the best example um man let me think um let me come back to that I don't have a clear example popping to mind, sorry. But uh, let, me, let me take Peter in. Thanks, Liv. This was super fun. No worries. Thank you. And if anyone has a, any examples, feel free to pop in the chat. You know, we'll see yeah, what please I'm do. Uh, wisdom here. And thank you, Anjan, for uh, hosting that portion. If you have any questions now, uh, pop in the chat. I'll take, on, uh, take you in a moment. Uh, I'll ask uh, Liv a question myself. Yeah, Anjan mentioned... Uh, uh, Hyper objects, Timothy Morton's hyper objects, basically like uh, objects that are so big that they transcend spatial and temporal boundaries, uh, like global warming is an example he uses. And he's coming to Stoa soon. And so I'm reading his book right now. And there's this mm. phrase I really liked in it. Uh, he, he calls like many normal objects are footprints of hyper objects. Uh, and to repurpose his phrase for, for Moloch, like things that are footprints uh, of Moloch. I'm curious when you got your uh, Moloch download after reading like Scott Alexander's piece, what kind of psychoactive effect did it have on your life? Like what Moloch footprints did you start seeing or like couldn't stop seeing? Um, mm. like Instagram beauty filter thing that you had on your, your channel is, is an example, but I'm curious how you started seeing these Moloch footprints in your like everyday relationships. Uh, and if what did that invoke in your body? Like when did like a paradigm mm. started emerging, shame, despair. Um, so yeah, I'm curious if you can speak on that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I started, certainly just started noticing in myself when I was like adopting a needlessly scarce mindset. Like I grew up, my my first you know 25 years on this earth, I was like a pathologically competitive person. Like I just saw everything as like, how can I be the best at this? Like if someone else did well at something, my mind's automatic jump would often be like, oh, how does this hurt me? Which is this like very destructive mindset. And it was this like deeply zero sum, um, you know, needlessly zero sum mindset. Um, and so when I read, you know, Meditations on Moloch and I started like thinking about this more, I was like, huh, that's, that's this example of like, you know, not that I think Moloch is an actual entity that can infect you, but like if it were, that would be what it would do to people to make them like see zero sumness where it doesn't actually exist and thus make them behave in this selfish, um, you know, this, this destructively selfish way. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, it just like it just created this sort of, I guess, this neural pathway in me where, whereby when I would do something and I would catch myself being like annoyed because I hadn't won a thing or, or um you know, I see someone who I consider sort of my peer, like win a big poker tournament that I didn't. And I was like, oh, and I was like, ah, oh, interesting. That's Moloch. And so it was, it just like, it just sort of formed this habit. And the thing is, it's like once, you know, I don't want to overfit it. And like, I, the trouble is once you get like a sort of a concept in your head, you tend to fit it to everything. But I, I think this might be one of the exceptions where it really does apply to so many things um, that, it, you know, I, I would just, 
it, it's like my it's now like a sort of default default state in my mind where if I'm like seeing a problem go wrong I'm like oh let's see is this is this a Moloch driven problem yes or no so it just became kind of a habit um and how it like feels I don't know it definitely it's definitely gotten to the point where it's like intuitive um I like I just get a sense I'm like oh this smells Molochy and and then like examine it and it usually is so um but as to how I developed it I can't really give any like concrete um Ex or methodology for people to adopt other than just like again like just keep reading meditations on Moloch and then think about oh does that, this industry like oh this industry is going wrong let's see why and see whether it like the the, the blueprint fits and usually it does mm -hmm. yeah that's why I like the concepts because like so high leverage you can apply it to, mm -hmm. to make things and, and so my follow-up question is when you kind of like feel the footprint of Moloch in your body mind whether it's like you know, emotional or like that hyper competitiveness what um like like Aikido moves have you developed in order to kind of like not indulge in it and kind of like pause and like be less Moloch-y? Um, well, for me, actually, it's, it's I try and, this sounds silly, but I try and like channel win-win. Um, you know, if I catch, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling, I feel that tension. I'm feeling this sort of zero, this full zero or something. So I'm like, well, what would win-win do? And when win would go, oh, that's cute. That, you know, that, that, there you go again. It's okay. You like it's old, old habits die hard. You know, so I, I, I try and sort of treat myself with because when win would be compassionate, um, but at the same time it'd be like, but come on, like this is not fun. Like you, you know, you, you're better than this. It, it would be like a, a loving teacher kind of. So I try and give myself a bit of slack and um, you know commend how far I've come. I guess in my like personal growth. Um, but yeah, I, I just go. I, that my 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 personal go to is like well what would win win do, um how do we how do we make this a win win for everybody, um and it's it, it seems to be working at least um for me personally, yeah, I think that's a brilliant technique like create this win win tulpa <laughs> like this imaginary friend yeah. <laughs> like uh, yeah secrets council, um cool so we'll, we'll pivot to some Q and A pop your question in the chat if you have any uh Nick Benjamin you had a few uh, could I uh, ask you to ask one. They, they weren't questions, they were more commentaries. Um, so I don't really have a question and you're putting me on the spot, Peter. But, <laughs> um, but, but I mean, I, I guess I, I might as well. Uh, so I, I, was, I was musing on whether or not, um, whether or not win-win would have as its um, source of truth, not a relative standard of truth, but an absolute one. One that one that is not subject to, or or one that is not generative of of dualities, where you would necessarily have one party that wins versus one party that loses, but rather one where the truth is common to the whole. That is it, that is it is universal to every single living being, and therefore requires that we stand in for the whole. Um, so, yeah. So, there you go. Mm. Yeah, I've not considered that. Am I? initial gut reaction is that it would it would <laughs> sound stupid but it would actually pull on both because it can because it's just so omni capable um but that's the the absolute truth would be very important and is a thing that exists um i'm not sure i can say more than that but that seems that like i don't know that's the awful eye bulb so yeah it's a, it's a cool it's a cool question i like it's i like yeah it's worth playing around with well, I, I love I love your in, intuitive leap to the omni omni capacity of win win that it can do both both the relative yeah. knowledge and the absolute. It, it feels like one of those things where it's like you know um, again it's a Daniel thing where you, you, a shape from two dimensions a shape you know doesn't seem like it can be both a circle and a square but if you zoom out if you can add a third dimension you can see that it's a it's um, a cylinder. And thus, it, you know, and, and so it just, it, there's this higher dimensionality to the problem that we can't see, but win win can. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, we got Stephanie Lepp here from the Center of Humane Tech. Hi, Steph. Uh, and Moloch What's Friday. up, Liv? <laughs> good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, this is, I, I put this question in the chat. I mean, it's, it's actually, similar to what Peter asked about, like, how do you kind of prevent yourself from uh, just like um, falling into the trap, let's say, of thinking in this way, just thinking globally all the time in this way. And um, I mean, I, I love that you asked the question, what, what would win-win do? Um, I just, I just happen to be thinking about psychedelics because 
<laughs> Today we interviewed Rick Doblin. For those of you who don't know, he's the founder of MAPS. He's, he's like a, a the pioneer um, of, uh, of psychedelics in the US. And he, um, just like one thing that psychedelics used wisely can do is really re is reconnect us with our oneness with mm -hmm. each other and with all of life. And that is like a very uh, Moloch transcending um, way of thinking. And so I just wonder, t like, how, how do we think about and talk about it's like, on the one hand, want people to understand this. On the other, there is like this self fulfilling prophecy danger or info hazard danger that to the extent that we understand it, we kind of maybe get stuck in it. I mean, famously, John Nash, went nuts right so um yeah i just wonder how you think about talking about moloch and teaching about moloch in a way that maybe doesn't get us stuck in thinking in that way always mm. <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure there is a an info hazard aspect to any of this you know i did wonder like by <laughs> you know, by literally dressing up as Moloch for that Beauty Wars video, and I'm going to do it again, maybe in a different form um, for the next one, which I'm working on, you know, am I doing a bad thing by like literally bringing it to life? Um, and I, I've asked a bunch of people this, and I, the vast majority of responses are like, no, it's fine. Um, and it's it's better to just raise awareness of the, the, most people are like going through life without any idea that this is even an issue. Um, you know, that, sorry, that, that it's a thing and like they don't they don't have the words to describe, even though I think most people like actually intuitively feel Moloch in terms of like that the, there's this problem going on. Um, it's not it's very, very rarely been like um, it's not sufficiently it doesn't have a name that people understand or know well enough. Um, so, sorry, remind me, you, you just, just summarize your question again. Go. I mean, it sounds like you're already thinking through it, like how to not, yeah, sure. How to not turn our conversations about or education about Moloch into an info hazard or into Right, a, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think my, my, again, the reason why I think I'm on the right path doing, you know, trying to popularize this is because I think we're fucked if we don't anyway, I think we're fucked either way, you know, so mm -hmm. at least this stands a chance through education of getting more people aware of the thing. And therefore like, because as, as you know, we sort of discussed earlier, um, it, it, we need these both, we need the bottom up and top down approaches yeah. and without having sufficient threshold of people aware of the problem in the first place. And like, you know trying their hardest to not be molecky um i don't i don't really see a way out so just, I just don't wait too long down. before you make the god of win-win video no I, I no i and, and, <laughs> and i i intend so the series is gonna be a four-part series i've done episode one a year ago now i can't believe it's been a year um two three and four are gonna come out very in close succession um and the fourth one is where i like well, the idea is it's going to be a conversation between Moloch and Win-Win uh, to uh, where Win-Win converts Moloch to its team. At least right. that's the idea. Right. But I don't know what that how that conversation is. I don't know how to do it. Uh, and I mean, that's you know one of the reasons I actually wanted to have this conversation with you guys because I feel like this is the brain trust on this concept. Have um, you seen Moana? I just can't help it. Have you seen Moana? Oh. Moana... So Disney has really been evolving how it deals with the bad guy. This is the last thing I'll say. <laughs> um, yeah. But in Moana, the bad guy is the good guy without her heart. Huh. Moana just gave her her heart back. You get, you have no idea. Sorry if I just spoiled Moana for everybody. Um, no, it's fine. No, it's watch great. I'll go and watch it. I've never watched it otherwise. <laughs> um, but yeah, Disney has really been, I mean, and it hasn't, it's still like bad guy is good guy without heart rather than like we contain multitudes and like, but like Disney is definitely like, yeah, has been evolving. I'll just, that's the last thing I'll, yeah. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go and watch that. But like, yes, seriously, any, I like, if any of you guys have an idea of like the kind of conversation between these two characters, how it would look, um, I would love any, any thoughts and ideas on that. Cause I, I don't see it being a good video without sort of a, 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 like, uh it, I, it certainly wouldn't be sufficient my my mind is not sufficient of figuring that out so it would be good to get lots of people's thoughts on that uh, and feel free to uh, throw some suggestions in the chat what's coming up for me uh, this is sort of like based off my um acting background and my explorations and kind of psychotherapy 
Uh, Carl Jung has this technique called active imaginations, where you sort of embody certain archetypes and you just let them speak to each other. Mm. So like, imagine if someone kind of like embodied the, the felt sense of Moloch and another person embodied uh, Win Win. And then you just like <laughs> let them have a conversation, like an improv mm. conversation. And it could go incredibly bad, but just, you know, like see what happens, see what emerges and maybe some good content comes from it. No, that's great. I love that. I'm trying to figure out if there's any way I can make this video without being on large amounts of psychedelics. <laughs> yeah, make it possible. Um, Not that I do that, but you know. <laughs> uh, Rachel Haywire, you had a, a question. Hi. Yeah, so my question is about Moloch in relation to status and class and power. Now, if somebody's doing something that's against the group, they're going off on their own random selfish desire, or, you know, the group can just kick them out or give them a timeout. Um, but say it's a powerful leader who has a vain fixation on doing something for their own personal grudge or glory, and this thing is going to invoke my luck, right? Um, but everybody has to, um, you know, obey them to, to cooperate, I guess. Right. Um, so, so when does that kind of cooperation become, um, you know, like uh, living somebody else's Moloch? You know what I'm talking about? Like, what, what, when can you just say no? You know, um, <laughs> to, to somebody who's doing something like that that has that level of power. Um, yeah, is Moloch different depending on class and status? um so just so i didn't hear you that well um your question is how um how can depending on like different power hierarchies how can people with lower down in the hierarchy um combat if someone higher up with someone with more power who's acting moloch is that correct yeah and also is moloch the same if somebody higher up is doing it and if somebody lower down is doing it, because if somebody lower down is doing right. it, you can just kick them out. But if somebody higher right. up is doing it, you might be forced to cooperate. So is there a difference yes. in the mullock, the high and the low? And yeah, and how can the low combat it if somebody's doing it high? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as I can tell, I mean, it it's it seems like, you know, it, it would be a you know, Hitler is a great example of someone with a lot of power who was deeply molecky in their you know, approach to, you know, in their worldview and the, and the actions that they took, right? Um, yeah. And so that was, that. that's the, the absolute nightmare. That's the worst case scenario. Um, so yes, different, depending on the sort of the, the social structure, um, it, you know, it's 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 extra important let's say you know like ideally if i'm gonna put a, a bunch of my time and effort into creating this like you know educational tool of how to make people less mollicky i'm going to direct it at whether it's business leaders um politicians and so on people in power it's much more important that they um that they understand this concept as quickly as possible because they're the ones building the technologies or making new policies and so on um yeah uh so i yeah i think you know as a group who are all trying to solve this problem I, it's it's definitely worth sort of stratifying our efforts and and focusing on those in power as a priority um it's 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 not like you know we it, we can't fix moloch until everyone on earth understands moloch you know i think it, we, i'm sure there's like some like pareto optimal solution to this where it's like let's focus on the most you know most powerful people as a priority um yeah i think that principle applies i hope that kind of answers the question yeah thank you thanks rachel uh, something about like like learning a power literacy and de demystifying it is such a um feels like a good moloch uh, uh jujitsu move um so maybe we'll sneak in one more question uh james you had a question hello i live my question Hi. is uh, imagine your video series gets a billion views and all right, it's total success. Everyone is asking you, now what? Um, what would your next move be? Just kind of ah. gut, <laughs> gut, gut reaction. Don't think too hard. I know, no, it's a good question. Um, 
my next move would be to create some kind of social infrastructure whereby all those people can talk to each other um and um you know and uh, perhaps it might need a team of sort of win-win custodians to help guide and and help it sort of like slightly self-organize but i would I, i would imagine the you know the solution to this if you've got a billion people who are on board and wanting to fix this give them away so that they can communicate to each other and like where I mean, hopefully you wouldn't even need to enforce good faith norms because if people are getting it and are excited by it, then by and large, good faith stuff would would uh, at least you know the cream would rise to the top in that regard, and it wouldn't be too corruptible. But that said, I'm sure everything is corruptible, even a group of like win-win people. Um, so uh, yeah, I think my gut the, the thing would be to, like design as as some kind of social infrastructure whereby um, they can. Um, convene and start delegating tasks and ideas um i i would like to think this would be analogous with some of the like game b concepts right that's what um you know the, most people talk about it needs to be this like again bottom up and top down emergent property where like sort of group decision making can occur um but yeah that's that's as far as i've got <laughs> again any ideas much appreciated um yeah yeah social infrastructure love it thank you thank you um so yeah uh any kind of parting words you'd like to leave us with um maybe anything that came alive for you during the session you the bookmark for later i mean yeah the honestly the main i know this is not the purpose of this you know I, I know you guys came to learn from me but you know I mean full honesty I was quite apprehensive of doing this session because I feel like you know I'm the dumbest person in the room here uh you guys are kind of the experts and and uh at least you guys have been thinking and studying this stuff a lot longer than I have um and so like one of my the, the coolest thing I could get from this is having a way to whereby you guys can reach out if you have any ideas of like ways to bring this concept to life or if you know think I'm doing it wrong any just any feedback basically would be massively helpful because like I'm in you know I'm in the thick of like writing these new scripts right now and uh I also want to do a podcast on the like this idea of like healthy competition more healthy versus unhealthy competition and uh win-win so um you know, not at all to like ask you guys to, to do my job for me, but any any ideas you have, but like, I'm just, I I, I really would love some feedback. Um, so uh, happy to share. I, I my my email is info at liveberry.com. Um, uh, yeah, feel free to just reach out because I would love to pick your brains. Cool. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I'm really looking forward for your upcoming videos. And I was thinking of doing like um, hackathons at the Stoa. Uh, in order to uh, engender insights and like develop psycho technologies so maybe we can like you know do a hackathon in order to figure out how to like summon win-win uh so it could be like a, a council for everyone's shoulder um yeah so maybe a further collaborations in store and we'll, we'll keep in touch there um so i'll make some closing announcements in a, a moment but Liv, thank you so much for coming to the thank you. The wonderful Thanks. session. apologies uh, for the internet problems well no worries we're, we're good stoics here um and uh the next session coming up at Stoa is called the Wisdom of Iris, Collaborative Sense Making uh, with AI. And John Ash, he's uh, working with OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 to aggregate uh, the collective belief of a group into a single uh, voice. Uh, and we've been doing some trippy experiments here where we're like collective journaling and then we're putting it in this uh, thing he's calling Iris and we're talking to it. And so like this like uh, temporary sage emerges at the Stoa that we were engaging in dialogue with. So um, that session is... Uh, coming up next week you can check that out and more sessions are at the distilla.ca um so that being said uh Liv, everyone thank you so much for coming thank stuff. you thanks for listening everyone and thanks on john for uh, being a wild man as always <laughs>